Jake, really appreciate you covering out some time today. Yeah, Mark, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, listen, I'd love to start the conversation today with, uh, you know, going back to your interest in nutrition, you know, where did that grow from? You've written about early struggles with body weight and of course playing football and things like that in childhood. Can you, can you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. You know, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a deep history, but um, yeah, I, you know, my early interest in nutrition came from being an overweight adolescent and then uh, really enjoying playing football. And, And once I got to junior high ball, you know, you had to be below a certain body weight to be able to, to carry the ball athletically. Right. So I had, I had to lose weight and my dad was uh, always a fit fitness guy, you know, had some different diets he would do here and there. Um, and then eventually he was like, Hey man, maybe you should try out this Atkins diet. And so I, I did the Atkins diet and I was, I was blown away because I was having not great success losing weight. I was doing, um, like Ensure meal replacements, which I love Ensure, by the way, but it just, it was not working for me. So we did this and I lost a ton of weight, but I was also blown away by how much different I felt physically. I mean, I got headaches, my energy was low, but the weight was sliding off. And that was the first time in my life. I remember sitting and thinking, whoa, what you eat has a massive impact on your body. And that kind of blew me away. So from there, you know, I went through high school and I I played some college uh, football, just division three up at Case Western. And then the goal shifted a little different. It was more about, okay, how do I get bigger biceps? You know, the whole bigger, stronger, faster concept. Um, What position were you playing? uh, I was a nose tackle. Nice. So I was a nose tackle. And I think, um, I think freshman, sophomore, junior year, I played at maybe 225, 235, 245. But the you know interesting part of that is to play that position, you need some extra body weight on you. And just for vain purposes, I enjoyed having a leaner physique. So I would bulk up during the season and then cut down really hard in the off season and, and lose a bunch of weight, oftentimes getting uh, to well under 200, usually about 185 to 195. I'd have to get down to to have sort of that lean physique. So I had this really intensive weight cycling process. And then after that, you know, after you leave college, I, I weight cycled kind of unintentionally, right? Where it was just yeah. sometimes I would gain weight and then I'd be like, oh man, okay, this is not a great place. And and then it wasn't to get to a really awesome physique. It was just to get some health back. So yeah, uh, yeah I've had a long history of always loving nutrition and then just having this weight cycling, whether it was intentional or otherwise. And the transition to like actual nutrition as a career changed during college as well, because uh, I actually went in as an engineer, which was fun, right? I was good at math and science, that whole deal, right? Nice. But then I, I found myself spending so much time reading about nutrition and like not spending enough time on the engineering homework. So finally, <laughs> it got to a point where I just had to say, maybe I should just transition majors. Yeah. And I did and never looked back. I, I, I've had a blast with, with nutrition. It is my favorite thing to do and talk about. Awesome. Well, I mean, I'm looking forward to diving into some of the work that you've done and contributed to. And, you know, maybe even before then, we could start with this weight cycling, because at the time, you know, not a lot of players, I imagine, were doing a similar thing. Was that you're just leaning on what you learned from a nutrition standpoint, were other players getting curious on how you were getting lean and adding all this weight back to play on the line? Yeah, you know, I always read a lot about nutrition nonstop. 24 seven. That is just what I fell into and really enjoyed doing. I'd say few people enjoyed that weight cycling, but I also was involved in wrestling in like high school. And so you, you did have people do um, some really strict weight control strategies and, and harsh diets and otherwise that aren't maybe necessarily the best health wise. I don't recommend anything I did, by the way, I don't think it was a healthy (laughs) process. Um, so yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of us, but in the wrestling community, I'd say there, there was definitely a lot more people that were really familiar with the process itself. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, we'll, we'll circle back to that because when it comes to offensive and defensive linemen and, and, you know, college and professional football, there's obviously some, some concerns when we retire, but, but before we do that, why don't we jump into this idea of being, you know, metabolic health, obviously top of mind now within the last year and a half of COVID and increasing risks of, of poorer outcomes. Um, is it possible to be metabolically healthy and be obese? You know, you've done some research in this area. So maybe can you start by defining that term metabolically healthy obesity? 
Yes. And it's, it's, it's a great term because it, it's such an awesome debate and it, it's still just for all the listeners, it's a huge question in the field still, right? It is not perfectly well-defined in terms of our understanding of it. So when we talk about this concept of a healthy obesity phenotype, it's uh, essentially, we know if you have obesity, right? Uh, it typically comes along with biomarkers that are associated with that, that are also associated with downstream risk of other diseases. We can think of elevated blood glucose, right? Your blood sugar, elevated triglycerides or cholesterol, essentially fat in the blood, right? And so you have these elevations of, you know, nutrients in the blood circulating free fatty acids as well. And those are associated with poor health outcomes. You could also look at vitals like blood pressure, heart rate, and you see um, trends in individuals with obesity where all those biomarkers are shifting towards an unhealthy phenotype, increasing risk for disease. But there's a subset of people with obesity that don't have those negative looking biomarkers. Mm -hmm. They look similar to what a lean individual would look like. So they have obesity, they have this excess adiposity, all right? So physically the difference is clear, difference in BMI, body weight, and all of that. But their blood sugar and their cholesterol and their blood pressure are all normal. And so that is sort of what was defined as a metabolically healthy obesity. So this phenotype where you have obesity, but you don't have that change in all those underlying biomarkers that we associate with cardiometabolic disease. Um, and so that's kind of the, the difference there. And if you look through the literature, uh, if, you, if you're doing reading on this, you will see that the majority of studies don't have a standardized definition for what they consider this metabolically healthy versus metabolically unhealthy obesity phenotype. So it becomes a little difficult to parse through the literature and pick stuff apart. But um, for the most part, people have been able to define these two groups of individuals using cutoffs of some sort. Yeah. And, and you guys looked at, you know, almost a hundred sedentary adults in that study. And can you walk us through that, that setup and, and what you guys found? Yeah. Okay. So we did something very different and th this is, this was such a cool study. And I, I think a really great addition to the metabolic, uh, the, the, meta the metabolically healthy obesity phen phenotype of um, so, sorry, in, ha in house, <laughs> we, we abbreviated as MHO and MUO and yeah. all these other things. MHO is cool. We could, <laughs> but anyway, um, so this was actually a study, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Kristen Hottie, and she is, a sleep metabolism nutrition researcher. She's also a registered dietitian. And she was interested to look at this, these two groups of individuals, right? These metabolically healthy and the metabolically unhealthy and compare their metabolic health on a different, more intricate level. So as I mentioned, the split is usually on these circulating blood biomarkers, right? And mm -hmm. usually when you look at studies, they'll have thousands of people. You mentioned ours had a hundred, which is a a good number, but it's, it's nowhere near thousands and thousands of people, right? Yeah. The reason for that is because we did one extra measure that no one else in the literature has done on these individuals. And that was called the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. Whoa, crazy. I know <laughs> no one knows what that is. So essentially what it is, it's um, an intricate procedure, which is the gold standard yeah. for measuring someone's insulin resistance, specifically the peripheral insulin resistance, we focus on the skeletal muscle. The reason to do that is it's really the primary physiologic defect that leads to downstream metabolic disease, like type two diabetes. So to do this procedure, we lay people down in a hospital bed and we infuse essentially glucose and insulin into their bodies. Yep. And by doing that, we just get these really intricate measures of what their peripheral insulin sensitivity is. So what we did in this study, and um, the only reason this was feasible is because uh, Dr. John Kerwin, who is, boy, he has been a leader in the field of metabolism and nutrition for since the eighties. What is that? Three decades now? Going yeah, into a going fourth on decade. Four, yeah. Right, right. So he is just, he's been doing phenomenal work um, since, since aerobics was cool. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. So he came out of that Ball State lineage, um, which any of you that follow the exercise science world, that is like the realm to be in, in terms of exercise science physiology. Um, and he's just done such awesome work, everything from uh, glycogen and the skeletal muscle to the impact of diet on insulin resistance and lots of work on whole grains and glycemic index. It's, it's phenomenal. But one of the things he did is over the years, he did all these studies and he made sure when he did these hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamps, his protocol was perfectly standardized. And so what that let us do is that let us take multiple studies that he did, combine that together, and then analyze these individuals with this metabolically healthy or unhealthy phenotype, and then look at deeper. What does it look like when we actually look at what they're, what I would call true insulin sensitivity is right. Yeah. Um, when you look at the, those clamp measured values, I mean, this is, this is like an eight hour procedure, right? You can't do this to normal people in a clinical setting. That's why it's so cool. Yeah. So, um, I Absolutely. guess you want to get to like, what, what did we find? Right. Like what, what, exactly. Well, now you got everybody, everybody on the edge of their seats. What was, uh, what were some of the key findings there? The biggest one was that we could define these two groups. We had people that were different that matched for obesity, but were different in terms of those circulating biomarkers. But when you look at their insulin sensitivity, they were exactly the same. And they were both much poorer than an otherwise lean individual. Wow. So, yeah. And that was kind of the, the critical piece of the paper was identifying that, okay, even though they're technically considered metabolically healthy by these circulating biomarkers, their underlying insulin sensitivity is still not good. And that is just a, a that's big to know for your long-term progression of disease risk. hundred percent. I mean, it's, um, you know, it comes back to this question I was going to come to previously about the athletes and the retired athletes, because we see that typically retired NFL players, you know, obviously you have a much lower risk. I think it's 45 or 46% lower risk of cardiovascular events. And then we get the subset of linemen that are 50 plus percent increased risk. And to your point here, when, you know, I've got a lot of clients who play football and rugby and, and these guys, their profiles do look great when we look at their blood pressure and we look at, you know, triglyceride to HDL and some of these biomarkers. But the question is always, well, after retirement, you know, this is where we get into trouble. And we, and so on a couple fronts, the first is when we're looking at just what you described here, obviously, weight loss is still going to be a key part of this whole story. No. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I, I love the example of the offensive and, and defensive linemen or some of these other sports where you need a higher weight to be really competitive in it. Um, because one of the things that happens when they're still active athletes is their exercise is super high, right? Yeah. Like you're three hours a day. Sometimes, you know I mean? These guys are going, 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 going. And, and muscle mass does, too, right? Oh yeah. I mean, just profound muscle mass because they're working out all the time. They're keeping that. And it, it just creates this really protective environment so that they don't have those negative biomarkers. And, and I mean, you, 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 you hit it right on the head, right? You, okay. But then they have retirement. And so then all of a sudden you have this situation where you don't have that intensive exercise. And even if you adjust your diet, right? Even if you adjust your diet and, and you, you maintain your weight, so you're not gaining too much weight, or maybe you even lose a little weight, that activity is just plummeted. And that's, that's where you can get into this um, risky area where men, now maybe you're going to develop that more unhealthy phenotype. And the reason we believe that would happen is because of that underlying concern with just having that excess adiposity that you know, Kristen Hottie and Dr. Kerwin and myself and others defined in, in that, re that pretty recent, what was that? 2019, 20, 2020, maybe I think it actually just came out 2021, even I, <laughs> I saw, we've been working, we've been working on it for a while. Now I can't yeah. remember when we actually put it out there, but that's the core concept, right? So like the, the general thought, I think if you look at the leaders in the field on defining these healthy and unhealthy uh, obesity phenotypes, the general thought is that the metabolically healthy obesity phenotype is transient and it's temporary. And you can only maintain that for so long if you have good activity, if you have a stellar diet, and if you're really doing everything for optimal health. And so once you lose something like activity or once your diet shifts and maybe you have a lot more saturated fat, right? Or, or added sugar, 
all of a sudden those other factors that are really potentially damaging long term tend to creep up. Yeah, it seems like it's it's buying us some time to be fit and to be have these good biomarkers if you are obese and in that that healthy phenotype. But as you're saying, we're still going to need to we still need to make some changes down the road to be able to achieve that uh, that weight that we're after. And this is something that I'd love to get your opinion on. Um, recently, had Prof. Paul Larson on in this term over fat versus obese. You know, we obviously have especially when we get to different somatotypes and you know more of the endomorph type, or we're talking you know Lyman or that type as well. That conversation around just the actual fatness being the problem versus the weight and curious in terms of your thoughts on how we describe these things, you know, obviously we classify things in terms of obesity, but where's that on the scale in terms of over fatness, obesity, and and how might that play into this whole story? Yeah. So the, the funny thing with obesity is the way we define it is by a simple metric. BMI, right? And it doesn't take into account any, anything you mentioned. And I, I won't go too deep into that because I'm, I'm sure you guys talked about it on other podcasts. But my, my general thought is that where you store fat matters, right? It matters for your metabolic health. Some fat storage areas seem to be protective. We talk about like subcutaneous fat, sort of more on the peripheral of the body. That seems to be protective to excess eating, right? And then you have the visceral fat and that seems to be damaging, right? And so if you're having fat around your organs, that's not protective, but that grows and that causes more metabolic issues than if the other type of fat grows. And then there's the, the where do you store your fat? And, and does that matter? And, and we know, you know, the, the apple versus pear sort of deal yeah. um, and differences in cardiometabolic risk. So I think those all play a major factor in defining that sort of metabolically healthy obesity phenotype. Like if you found people that had subcutaneous pear shape body shapes, I think they would probably be in that metabolically healthy range for a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. But if I had to guess, the underlying insulin resistance is probably still going to be there and it's probably going to catch up to you eventually. So I think, I think it can play a role up to a point. Um, and and so, some of that is also like the, the amount of excess body weight too. Right. So yep. like we know that, you know, if you look at um, the mortality curves, I don't know if you guys have talked about that on, on this before, but there's like a mortality and BMI, right. X and Y axis. And at a really low BMI, your mortality is high, right. If you're super, super thin and yep. then you get to a certain range and there's a, there's a bottom point, right. The, and that's the healthiest BMI. And then it goes up from there. Uh, and that healthiest point is usually in the like mid low twenties, like 23 ish. So that's technically like just under that overweight category. So there's something a little protective to having some fat on your body. Um, and then for different populations, for example, older individuals, that J shaped curve is right shifted. So there's more protection for having a little extra body weight. So there's just such a huge complexity around, uh, okay, where is the, the healthiest amount yeah. of fat and what type is it? So it's a, it's a really awesome area um, that, man, I think, I think we still have a lot to learn on exactly what's best. Yeah, you just nailed it with the context really driving everything, isn't it? I mean, who is it in this scenario? What age are they? Are they an older population? Because obviously muscle loss and sarcopenia then becomes a huge problem. So having some extra weight can actually help with that. Um, If we circle back to the strategies someone might use then, so metabolically healthy obese, deciding, okay, I want to, you know, reduce fat mass to improve this outcome or that retired player who's deciding, okay, I'm weighing 330 pounds at six foot. I need to lose some, some fat mass. If we stay on the idea that this insulin, this underlying insulin resistance, and of course, everyone, you know, we like to pit different dietary strategies against one another. And we know that, you know, the rules of the game for weight loss are similar amongst all of them. But when it comes to insulin resistance, there's a little bit of nuance between the lower carb and lower fat. So I don't know if you could explore that uh, for listeners and viewers. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first I'll say in terms of like what the optimal goal would be for like, let's say one of those pro athletes that was an offensive lineman. Certainly manipulating diet, manipulating exercise can be helpful, but the, the number one thing I, I would still say is you got, you got to lose that weight. Um, and some people have done it really successfully. I'm, I'm sure you've seen Michael Strahan is everywhere now. Joe Thomas is really emerging on the scene. Joe Thomas is a, I mean, seeing before and afters of him is pretty striking. Yeah. 
And he's my favorite. I'm a Cleveland guy. So I was born and raised in Cleveland. So I've been watching Joe Thomas, you know, since he was drafted. Yeah. In my mind, one of the best offensive tackles of all time, for sure. I mean, Hall of Famer, number 73, just knocking that in for everybody that's not familiar with him because he's awesome. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. he was, I mean, he was huge. He was a 300 pound guy and he's got to be 250 ish now. And just, he's got a great physique and he just, It happened almost instantaneously. He retired and then just boom. And that's really the healthiest way to do it is to, you don't need that excess weight anymore. Get it off. Easier said than done, right? Like I I want want to be really clear. Simple, but not easy. (laughs) Simple, but not easy. Absolutely. (laughs) So in terms of the the differences between the diets, I mean, my, my goodness, um, You know, I've done research in in ketogenesis and the potential role that can play in insulin sensitivity. Um, And, you know, it's it's such a it's such a weird dynamic. Uh, I think right now there's a big popularity for the really low carb, purely ketogenic approach compared to what I would consider a more traditional approach, which is something that stylistically looks more like the dash or Mediterranean diets. Yep. Um, and I'm assuming those are common enough now that I don't need to necessarily yeah, no, describe good. them, <laughs> yeah. but it's essentially high fruit, high vegetable, like lean proteins, right? If you just kind of think about it that way. And so um, it tends to also be a little higher on the carbohydrate end. Um, both of those can be effective for weight loss if, if the calorie range is right. One of the issues with the ketogenic diet is if you don't have something like poor blood glucose, like we see in individuals with diabetes and you go on this ketogenic diet, and then you were to take some of the tests they do for diabetes, Mm -hmm. uh, like an oral glucose tolerance test or the, the clamp that we do, your measures will be worse than if you had a carbohydrate diet. And so that's, you know, really kind of weird because if you take the opposite of that and you look at what they do in some of the clinical trials, uh, like Verta Health trial was a great one where they took individuals that had obesity and a lot of them had diabetes and they, they put them on a ketogenic diet and they were like, hey man, we had them lose weight, their blood sugars improved, their A1Cs, and these were dramatic improvements. People were coming yeah. off medications and it was like, whoa. So I think there's a, a difference in terms of the immediate impact you get when you're someone that has issues with blood sugar control and really minimizing the intake of dietary carbohydrates, you know, that eventually turn into sugar has a, in my mind, a a really different, powerful, positive effect than if you're otherwise healthy going on a ketogenic diet, it it doesn't have that same pronounced benefit. So, you know, having that um, potential temporary, you know, impairment of glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity, I don't see the benefit in an otherwise healthy person as much as I do in someone that is concerned about those risk factors. And I will say, I don't, I don't want to make it too crazy, but you know, when you go on the ketogenic diet and I mentioned, if you're healthy, these other markers are worse than they would be. That's temporary. If you go back on the carbohydrate diet, it it all comes back, but it's, it's a really cool dynamic to think about in terms of selecting a specific diet for a specific person and what's the best benefit they're going to get out of it. Yeah. Especially when we think of, you know, you just mentioned obviously weight loss being the key metric here. That's going to be driving a lot of this. I remember talking to Dr. Nicola Guess a few years back and, you know, something like 90% of type two diabetes remission is weight loss. And we just think, I mean, it just blows your mind of 450 odd million people around the world. And sometimes we almost get too caught into the strategy and not just the 30,000 foot view of, is this person getting, you know, getting lighter. And so it's good to know that there are a lot of strategies and also good to know that potentially to what you just said, if there's a specific context with a specific group, Hey, maybe this strategy can be, you know, can be better. And that kind of leads us into some of these popular dietary strategies. Um, carnivore diet, obviously being one that's, that's grown in, in recent years. And, you know, I've had Dr. Sean Baker on the podcast and, and talking about, you know, basically higher protein diets with lower energy. If we want to think about the principles of it and how that can help with weight loss or can help with people who are struggling with, you know, some metabolic conditions, but you know, there isn't a lot of data out there obviously. And, but, but, but you recently contributed to a study following folks who'd been following a carnivore diet for, for over six months. Can you share with us, you know, some of the characteristics of the group or, or some of those common goals of why these individuals were pursuing that diet? 
Yeah, this was this was such a fun project. So I have my doctorate in nutrition. I'm a registered dietitian, and the carnivore diet, in the most blunt sense, is opposite to like everything we <laughs> recommend ever. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's very very different. And um, there's a lot of people that are following it. And whenever there's something where a lot of people are following it, it starts to to pique your interest. And then what was so unique about it is people were also reporting a lot of health related benefits. Again, all self-report things you see on social media and, yep. and conversations with people like MDs that promote it, like, like Dr. Dr. Baker, Dr. Baker and otherwise. And so then it's like, okay, we need to start the research process in this population. See what's we going need on to here. Better, we need to better understand this. So this was a collaboration between um, myself down at Pennington Biomedical, some of the researchers at Harvard, Belinda Lenners, and uh, Dr. David Ludwig, and then also um, help from those carnivore community individuals like Dr. Baker, um, Travis Statham, we talked talked with quite a bit too, and uh, to just help get access and understanding to that community and you know how they were really utilizing the diet. And so, this was all survey self report data, but it, it's kind of the study was based to be the the first representation of what are these people eating and what benefits do they think they're getting out of it, and then put that in a, a research, you know, scientific approach method to better characterize it, as opposed to just having a bunch of articles on Reddit and otherwise, you know, yeah. you know talk, talking about the study. So it was a, a really awesome report. And, and what we showed is that a large majority of the, uh, of the people were following this diet. They typically ate red meat based products. They very rarely ate fruits and vegetables, you know, which is standard recommendations for that carnivore diet. And I, I will be a little cautious when I say the term recommendations, uh, Sure. <laughs> that, 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 those aren't recommendations coming from organizations. Those are just standard um, profiles for the diet. But most people reported generally positive improvements in a lot of their medical measures. Um, similar to what I mentioned with Verda, people reported coming off diabetes or other medications after consuming this diet. And these were all people that did it for at least six months. So it was it was people what we would consider for a diet. I mean, relatively long term, it moves yeah. more towards a pattern of eating than what we would typically consider like a short term diet to reach a specific goal. So it was just really interesting to see that um, there were some side effects related to it. We had some GI items and otherwise, but generally they were very low. One of the items that I thought was really cool is we didn't see self-reported side effects of the diet that would be consistent with micronutrient deficiencies. So, yeah. um, you know, that's one of the issues with, with this diet is it's, it's very linear, right? It's got kind of a, a, a niche select group of foods that it eats and it's, it's kind of just meats, right? Like if, if you, you categorize the diet in one word, it's meats. Yeah. So you miss out on all these other micronutrients and phytonutrients that are just split throughout the rest of the diet. And what effect does that have? We have, we have no idea from my personal perspective. I'm a big, like, I like phytonutrients, man. We don't, we don't measure them a lot. I think, yeah. I think they play a big role in health long-term. Sure. So it's, it's hard to get that impact, but, but on this diet, you know, they, they don't have those, but we also didn't see the items that I kind of expected to see, which would be skin dermatitis related issues related to poor amounts of micronutrients. And, yeah. and we did like vitamin didn't C, see right? That. Yeah. You know, and so we didn't see that. Uh, we don't exactly know why. And, and certainly yeah. this is all self-report data, right? So there's a hundred percent, there's, there's a high possibility. I don't know why I said hundred percent. There's a high possibility that if all of these individuals were studied, the data wouldn't look exactly the same as self-report data, right? We know that that's an inherent issue with self-report data. For sure. And a, a few things jump out at me anytime we look at some of these fad diets. It's always the kind of trickle-down effects that people aren't even always aware of, of following a certain diet. And, you know, the first one's just people being inherently busy. And so these simple heuristics of, that make a diet super simple are really appealing. But as a side effect of that, it's just the production of ultra processed food when someone goes on a diet just plummets, right? All of a sudden, the 60% of their diet or 50% of their diet that was junk food goes away. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that, just first of all, before we touch on a few other parts of it, but that's, 
I mean, it's a pretty powerful thing, isn't it? When we remove sort of the really calorically dense, nutrient poor foods that are causing a lot of the, you know, dysglycemias and 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 caloric excess and weight gain. I love that you brought those two items up, the simple choices, right? The simple heuristics. I think just from a personal dietetic standpoint, when I do one-on-one counseling, there's so many food choices throughout the day, right? Yeah. Nonstop. You're bombarded with advertisements and food around you all the time. And every time you see something like that, you are making a decision. And it does get really difficult if you don't have certain on off switches in your mind to be, to be able to kind of self-regulate because everything we know about the body's regulation internally subconscious is telling you to eat that thing, mm. whether, whether that's because you lost weight and now you're trying to, to gain, you know, that weight back, your body just wants it back point. or, or if, yeah. Or if it's from the unbelievably powerful marketing and advertising strategies that are out there, it is insane. It is insane how good companies are at getting you to buy, click, or eat the item they want you to. And that's that's why those heuristics, I think, are so powerful because it helps combat that uh, difficult food environment. And what's the downstream effect? It's the next thing you mentioned, which is the ultra processed foods, right? Yeah. And keeping those down. And, and those have other issues where it's low nutrients, high calories. And then they're, they're also specifically designed to hit your tastes and make you want more and more and more. It's, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable the way these, these foods are manufactured and the advertising is done. It is so hard for so many people to maintain a healthy body weight just because of that scenario. And it's interesting, even when we go away for for trips with Canada basketball and we go to some countries that maybe don't have the most diverse cuisine, you know, and you have to repeat the same meals over and over again, you know, the staff, we don't mind because you're still getting your nutrients and stuff, but it's very much the same taste. And it's amazing how getting the players to keep eating enough becomes a real challenge because they just become sort of bored with the selections. Um, and so you can see that being part of some of these simple rules of you're repeating kind of similar foods. And so, um, but one of the areas that I feel gets missed is that we, we, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs are different than a steak when it comes to nutrient quality, right? When we look at even saturated fat intake, I mean, it's it's the processed foods, it's the hot dogs and the hamburgers that are primarily contributing. So can you touch on, you know, the difference between, what, you know, a steak versus what we're going to get in a hamburger or a sausage? And because those things still seem to get a little conflated, even amongst when some the expert dietitians or doctors are, are, are informing people. Sure. So, and I think the part of that, issue comes from macronutrient profile wise, the two items you mentioned can look very similar, Mm -hmm. right? So when we measure things in food, that's primarily what we measure macronutrients. So then when we judge food, that's what, that's what we look at. Even if you look at micronutrients, right? You have fortified food items and otherwise that can look very similar. So let's just, let's just say a scenario where you have these, um, a steak and a hot dog and you've matched the macronutrient profile, you've come close enough on the micronutrient profile. People don't fortify hot dogs, but let's just run with it. For example. Okay. <laughs> could be, it could um, be an area. <laughs> <laughs> so then how in the world would those things be different on your body? You remember what I said about those phytochemicals? And I'm like, hey, man, I think these have a, a major role. And there's evidence to support that. Um, I think there's the same thing in uh, animal products. And these are called zoochemicals. And it's, it's chemicals. Uh, I like to call them nutrients. They're not technically nutrients because you don't need them to live, mm-hmm. but man, phytochemicals and, and zoochemicals sound so much worse than phytonutrients and zoonutrients. Right. So yeah, I'll yeah. just, I'll call them <laughs> phytonutrients and zoonutrients, Fair enough. but they're, they're molecules, they're components to food that we don't measure that in some cases have been shown to have very positive effects on human physiology. Uh, The phytochemicals uh, often deal with uh, improved heart health and some other biomarkers. The zoochemicals, um, a great example is creatine, right? And we know the positive effect that has on sports performance. And so beyond that, there's um, certain types of fats, certain lipids, right? Certain proteins that have unique independent effects, beyond just their macronutrient energy content. Yep. And identifying those is an area that, uh, I mean, I, I think we're only hitting the tip of the iceberg on some of these items. Um, a comparison in milk is milk-based protein. And this has been shown to help with uh, bone mineral density in combination with calcium. 
but it's it's not calcium. It's just, it's just protein in milk, right? If you look at macronutrients, the same as you know any other protein, but it has a unique independent effect. And so that's what's so intriguing to me about this difference between your description of kind of like that ultra processed food item and a macronutrient micronutrient product that looks really similar uh, can still long-term, I think, have a very different effect on the body. Would you notice anything over the course of a week? I doubt it. A month? I doubt it. A year? I, I'd probably doubt it. But this is, we don't live for a year, right? We, we live for substantially longer. Average age is pushing 80. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think there's a huge difference when you talk about long-term effects. Yeah. And again, it might start to sound like recommending the carnivore diet, but I'm just more fascinated with exploring all these kind of nuances that come as a result of it. And like you said, something that's going polar opposite to the recommendations and yet not killing people. So what's going on here? Or people are actually improving. There's going to be some mechanisms at play. And, and the last one I'd like to touch on is just the difference between vegetables and fruit, because now we see a lot of the carnivores saying, well, actually what we'll do is we're going to include a lot of fruit. So all of a sudden we're getting more fiber, we're getting more antioxidants and polyphenols, et cetera but we're not necessarily getting as many vegetables. So I'm sure, like you said, self-reported, I mean, I'm sure these people are eating more vegetable here and there that doesn't get to uh, make it on the, on the list, but, you know, and, and again, not to pit well, certain foods, vegetables versus fruits, but could you describe some of the benefits that one might get from fruits that are similar to what we might get from vegetables? I'll first say that I'm, I'm not the most in tune with those intricate changes that are happening within the carnivore diet community and, and, and changes that sure. are happening. I will say there's an unfortunate and unnecessary fear and demonization of some vegetable products um, due to things like anti-nutrients and otherwise. So I want to make sure I first just start with, um, I don't believe that concern is real. That yeah. is um, conflated Electins and phytates and things like so, that. So yeah, I just want to make sure from my perspective, I portray that I do not think there's any reason to fear vegetable based products. First. Yeah, and, for, and also <laughs> to be clear here, for all of our athletes, we're, we're most of the time we're needing to get a significant amount of carbohydrate, and then so we're using a lot of whole grains and everything else. We'll definitely put the disclaimers up for folks. <laughs> um, but I, on top of that, you know, the cool thing about fruits is uh, a lot of it comes from the color, right? They're so colorful, and this this is all due to different essential phytonutrients that are contained in there. And you have high amounts of antioxidants, and some of them function in different ways, and. And so I, I think that's maybe where some of those uh, phytonutrient components of fruits may have unique benefits compared to some of the more bland looking straight green vegetables. Um, and certainly, I mean, they, they, they taste better, right? They got, yeah, they have, they got more spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's be honest, right? Uh, well, listen, I didn't mean to take us down this long a tangent on the carnivore side, but it's really fascinating stuff. And if we circle back to the, the metabolic side of things, and we talked about just conditioning being helpful and strength being helpful, and you've contributed to some research around the impacts of exercise on skeletal muscle clock machinery. Can you describe that in, in this pre-diabetic population? So similar to what we're talking about here? Absolutely. And this is, this is such a cool area. So this is a project really in our lab. Um, so the papers we've kind of talked about are, are really all offshoots from John Kerwin's primary line of research, which is in nutrition, metabolism, and, you know, obesity, diabetes, otherwise, right. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of us collaborators trained under John and then had some offshoots from there. So you had Kristen Hottie going down the metabolically healthy obesity and, and some other sleep related items. Myself, I've focused a little more on ketogenesis and I've done some whole grain work on, um, you know, whole body protein turnover. And then we have this other route, uh, which is clock machinery and um, chronobiology. And this is a route that was really spearheaded by um, Melissa Erickson out of the lab. And she's actually now at the... Translational Research Institute in, geez, where are that? Orlando, Orlando, Florida. A really outstanding, uh, you know, clinical translational research center. And she was really interested to understand, okay, in the skeletal muscle of individuals that have insulin resistance or otherwise, is there an issue with their clock genes or clock proteins? And, and what are those things, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure by now everyone's kind of heard the term circadian rhythm and it's this alignment with your body and all the other external signals. And if everything's aligned perfectly, then you have better, you know, met metabolic health. 
Um, but what's, what's really interesting is your whole body has a, 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 an internal clock, right? But then each of your different tissues also has a clock, including your skeletal muscle. And when those clocks are aligned, good to go. And when there's a misalignment, all of a sudden one's implicating one timing, but the other one thinks it's maybe another timing. And Melissa's question was essentially, okay, can the measures that we use to determine that internal clock in the muscle, is that different in these individuals? And she found some really interesting results on, on both the gene and protein level. Um, I would call it early preliminary work, but emerging and suggestive of a potential disruption of the metabolic clock in, in, these, in these individuals that have insulin resistance. So if we fix insulin resistance, does it fix the, fix the clock? Or if we address the clock, can it affect insulin resistance? I mean, yeah. that's the cool question, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really fascinating stuff. And I guess that the 30,000 foot view comes back to this idea, we need to keep maintaining strength and building strength, don't we? I mean, this is kind of a part of the the equation that's obviously gaining more momentum in the last kind of decade and a half as it becomes more, more commonplace, but it's, it's plays such a huge role in terms of, I mean, I had Rob Edinburgh on a few years back, just talking, obviously, as we use the intramuscular triglyceride, that's a powerful signal for, for improving insulin resistance. And so, you know, people don't necessarily have to go to the gym, but just lifting some heavy stuff is pretty, pretty good advice, right? Oh, absolutely. And I feel like there's going to be a continued push for that ever since, when did they define um, sarcopenia? Maybe 2016. Like, so sarcopenia is just like the, the long-term loss of muscle mass and muscle function, right? And it was always it was always kind of known roughly what it is. Old older individuals tend to be less muscle, less strength, right? But we didn't have a clinical definition. We didn't have a clinical diagnostic code for that. And this so this has just happened within the last decade, I think within the last five years, that we actually got one, a consensus definition, and two, clinical diagnostic coding in the hospital to actually say, hey, this person has sarcopenia. Yeah. And so now that we have this clinical item and this clinical diagnosis that matters for muscle strength and muscle function, Okay. Now the importance of that resistance training has a lot more oomph behind yeah. it, right? <laughs> to be able to maintain that as you get older, people have always, people, people in athletics have always known, right? There's a reason 45 year olds aren't in uh, the Olympics as much and aren't in <laughs> professional sports, right? <laughs> like other than what, like Tom Brady or whatever, yeah. but you know what I mean? For so, sure. um, and, and so it's just thing that was always kind of known, but now I think it's getting it, the, appropriate additional attention and momentum, especially for healthy aging. Tremendous. I mean, that leads into this idea of healthy aging and longevity. And, you know, we see a lot of work around fasting for longevity within some of that work. I always found a little paradoxical of suggesting to reduce protein intake, which is, you know, when we look at what we just talked about with, with sarcopenia and of course coming from the Toronto area with, you know, Stu Phillips and the group, not far away, obviously reinforce the benefits of protein intake on maintaining muscle mass and bone as we age you've contributed to some work around aging in humans and so you know could you share a little bit of the insights here obviously caloric restriction might play benefits we've got the fasting the protein intake just love to hear your your thoughts and, and insights from some of your work first impression i align with really what you mentioned where it's like okay in older individuals like you got to maintain muscle they have a little protective effect of body weight you know we mentioned that that j-shaped mortality curve being right shifted uh, I, I i'm with you i i, I agree 100 percent. but then i got involved in this in this in this research on this calorie restriction for healthy aging yeah. and this is super different from my realm in dietetics i work in a practice group that focuses on healthy aging and so much of our work is on malnutrition and I've given talks on malnutrition, not having enough, right? Getting more. We often are prescribing protein and calorie supplements more, more, more. Um, and so this approach is really different. And this stems from two primary clinical trials that, that came out of Pennington Biomedical. Uh, and it was the, they, it's called the calorie trial, uh, except they spell calorie, C-A-L-E instead of an O-R-I-E. Um, but it, it's a it's a trial where they took individuals that were otherwise healthy, right? Not even overweight or or with obesity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they restricted their calories by the goal was twenty five percent. And so what that does is you lose a little body weight, but more so than that, you undergo metabolic adaptation, 
right? And so this is where essentially everything slows down because your body realizes it's not getting more calories. So you, you lose weight, but you, you stabilize at a, a calorie intake level that is lower than you would anticipate based on your body weight. So it's, it's, yeah, a little bit of weight loss. That's not as important as the underlying adaptations. And then they studied these people for, for two years and, and they showed really interesting findings where the calorie restriction and that slowing of, of all this other metabolic processes actually impacted measures um, that, that we define as primary aging. And when I say primary aging, I mean, these are the internal cellular mechanisms, DNA damage, things like that, that we don't have ways to impact like items of secondary aging. Secondary aging would be a ton of the stuff we talked about, yeah. uh, excess adiposity, all those circulating biomarkers, right? We know healthy diet, exercise, you can impact those, right? You, you can have a longer life by impacting those, but the calorie restriction impacted these other measures that we just cannot impact uh, even by pharmacological items. And the only way we can impact them in like preclinical models is through genetic manipulation of animal species, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, that's what was so interesting about this finding is, okay, if you can then slow that and you think long-term trajectory, does it matter if you have less muscle mass, if the muscle is younger? And it stays just as functional. And, and that's that's the 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 question, right? Is fourth. Oh, geez, man. If, if you can if you could slow the aging process, maybe that less muscle mass is a is not as big of a negative as it would be in other scenarios. I mean, it's fascinating because at a real sort of 30,000 foot view, and I appreciate this is a little bit crude, but you know, we've only been having this consistent food for a very short period of time on, on planet Earth. I mean, hundreds of thousands of years walking around wondering where our next meal is. It seems like there's obviously some mechanisms in there that appreciate that that sort of hormetic response of having to go without for periods of time. I guess the the trick or the fine line will be finding that 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 balance between the going too long without with a restriction or too great a restriction and and those benefits, right? Hundred percent. I mean, I I couldn't say it any better. Yeah, well, listen. Jay, I could I could pick your brain all day here, but I want to I appreciate you uh you know your time and so you know, for yourself and your research and some of the topics that we talked about here, you know, what's the evolution of, of this in the next sort of five or 10 years, maybe you can speak to what you're doing or what you're excited about. Sure. Sure. I mean, Oh boy. So, uh, <laughs> so now I could, I could talk for five hours on what I'd love to do. Right. Yeah, exactly. uh, you know, my goal is really to, to better understand the relationship between nutrition and human health and, and do it at a level that is more individualized. I think the, the hot term now is precision nutrition. Um, but I, I have a small pilot trial coming up on that where it's testing multiple diets in the same person and then taking clinical measures and then trying to assess, okay, for this person, which diet performed better on their you know, primary clinical measure of interest, and then doing that in a number of people. And then trying to use these new AI machine learning approaches to understand can we get to the point where we have the data now can we predict it so yeah. that when a person comes in with a disease we can have a more targeted approach for them um and for my route as a dietitian i think a lot of that also includes that habitual behavior uh and including that not just biomarkers but what do you do every day how do you move right physical activity steps diet all of those different items. I, I feel like that's a major important factor because a lot of times we treat this data as if people are machines, right? And yeah. it's just like, okay, you know what? If you ate exactly this macronutrient profile, <laughs> this is what'll happen. And <laughs> we can't, we can't do that in real life. So that's why not easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's my realm. I, I'd really like to get into this precision nutrition understanding. Um, and my, you know, my, my personal areas of interest would be ketogenesis, whole grains, which are really kind of clashing ideas, but I think that's mm. what's so cool about yeah, exactly. precision nutrition as a concept, right? So that's where I'm going. And that's where, that's where I hope to be in the next uh, five, 10 years is have uh, some really great established research in this area. Amazing. We'll definitely look forward to uh, keeping tabs on that and, and, and reading up. In the meantime, where can people, you know, stay connected with you, keep up with your work and then, you know, connect on, on social media? Uh, awesome. Um, you know, I, I'm at Pennington Biomedical, so I highly recommend if you if you are interested in nutrition, check out the work that has come out of Pennington Biomedical, man. I mean, it is 
the Mecca for nutrition and metabolism research. And their website is just pbrc.edu. It, it is just a phenomenal research institute. Um, but with that on my own end, um, I'm on Twitter, Cake Nutrition. Uh, I'm starting up a, a video game stream on Twitch under Cake Nutrition as well. So if you're into video nice. games, come on. Uh, I'm just going to play random games and then talk about nutrition and metabolism the whole time. And we'll see what happens with it. I don't know. Awesome. I like playing games. <laughs> so I figured might as well. Do Buy the two. And then all at anyone at any time, always reach out to me. Um, you can do it through my private practice website, which is if you just go to cakenutrition.com. It will be on there too. But my email address is widely available on pbrc.com and otherwise. And I'm, I don't know if you do show notes or whatever. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah we'll put it all in the show notes for sure. Yeah, reach out. to. I, li- I literally just love talking about nutrition all the time. Like it is what I do. It's what I do for my job. It's what I do for my hobbies. And it's what I do for, for stuff like this. Like I, I just really enjoy nutrition. Tremendous. Well, listen, phenomenal insights today. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to keep it up with your work as we go. Yeah, I had a blast. Thank you so much for having me on. This was, this was really fun.